We are on a logging site today in Franklin County. Uh, Franklin County is in the upper Piedmont uh, region. It would be pretty similar to a lot of sites you might see harvested in the Piedmont region throughout the southeast. Uh, this particular harvest today is a hardwood harvest where they are harvesting hardwood logs, pulpwood, and chips for fuel. One of the most important things to consider with BMP implementation is your pre-harvest planning so that you have everything laid out before the harvest actually begins. A lot of the BMP uh, considerations relate to access structures, whether that is road access for trucks, access to the harvest area through skid trails, uh, or other access to the site. Uh, a lot of the disturbed area, a lot of the BMP considerations relate to stabilizing bare soil on those access structures. So on this particular harvest, uh, they have what is referred to as set-out trailers. This is a staging area uh, which is close to a public access road where they bring loaded log trailers out to this staging area. They drop them off and then road tractors can come and access the site uh, at any time and pick up the loaded trailers and bring back empty trailers. Uh, the reason they do this is because with this particular site, they primary landing and the harvest area is a long way from the uh, from the state paved access road. Uh, so they do this to facilitate uh, trucks getting in and out. So this is one of the considerations that they would uh, think about when they are planning this harvest to locate this staging area and make sure that they have the area uh, stabilized. They've, you can see they've added rock uh, and it's graded so that uh, they can access this, this site in most weather conditions. One of the operational considerations with where you locate your landings or locate areas where trucks are going to access it is that you do need to be on a high site. Uh, you can kind of see on this site that we are up on top of a hill here and it drops down below us. So operationally it helps you to keep the site drier and have your landing areas uh, up on the hilltops, but it also helps uh, from a BMP perspective to keep these areas away from the stream so that you have as much uh, distance as possible between these areas and the streams. So in addition to the access to the site, things to think about uh, for areas where you locate your access uh, such as roads, landings, skid trails, is to make sure that you avoid sensitive sites uh, such as wetlands and to the greatest, greatest extent possible keep everything uh, as far away from streams as you can uh, to avoid any, any possibility of sediment entering the streams. So when we think of different options for crossing a stream with a haul road, there's really three different options. You can use a bridge, you can use a culvert, or you can use a ford. And you can see behind me we have a ford on this uh, haul road stream crossing. The benefit of using a ford is that there's no structure there like a culvert that can get plugged up and can get damaged and wash out. Uh, it also, the other advantage of it is that it's a lot cheaper to construct than a permanent bridge. Uh, as you can see, this uh, particular stream crossing behind me would be too long to use temporary bridges. Uh, you just simply wouldn't be able to span that distance with a bridge and make it strong enough for a truck crossing without building a, a really expensive, really elaborate uh, bridge system. So in some cases, uh, a Ford is an acceptable option for trucking. Uh, with the BNP guidelines in Virginia, it's important to note that we would not skid through a creek on a Ford crossing. So if you're skidding, the only two options available to you would be a culvert or a bridge. Mm -hmm. 
So this is a Ford that's being used on a truck haul road. Uh, this was an existing road that was here and the, and the Ford was already in place uh, on this road. In some cases, you know, there, there are different options and you have different choices that you can make as far as what type of crossing structure that you use. Uh, and in cases where you decide to use a Ford, there are some things that you want to keep in mind as far as making sure that you minimize the impacts to the stream while you're using the Ford. So Andrew, tell us a little bit about what you look for and what you like to see on a Ford crossing uh, to make sure that they minimize the, uh, the potential for sedimentation. So whenever we look at a Ford crossing, we want to make sure that the approaches are gently sloped. This not only helps your access, you know, prevents breaking a, a truck axle or a spring, but it also, you know, decreases the gradient of which erosion could potentially occur uh, going down to a stream. We also like to see those approaches uh, armored really well. We like to see them non-erodible. Uh, we like to see stone on them if possible uh, in order to provide a good running surface for a truck. Um, we also don't want to introduce any additional material to the stream bed that may impact the flow of water. We don't want to dam up the stream by putting stone all the way through it uh, in a way that it uh, impacts the flow of water through there. So we're standing here next to a culvert, which would be another one of your options for crossing a stream uh, with either a haul road or a skid trail crossing. Uh, with culverts, it's important to make sure that they are installed properly. Uh, there are advantages and disadvantages to culverts. Uh, we've got Andrew, Andrew Vinson with the Department of Forestry, and Andrew's going to talk a little bit with us about some of the things that you might want to think about to make sure that culverts are installed properly. Thanks, Scott. Um, as part of my job, I look at a lot of stream crossings, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the advantages and disadvantages, as Scott said, as well as some of the, the specs that we like to see to make sure that a culvert is going to be functional in terms of protecting water quality, as well as providing you access to a track. First of all, whenever we look at a culvert crossing, uh, or a crossing uh, to, to use a culvert, um, you, uh, we want to look at the banks. You typically don't want to have very gentle banks, slopes coming down to it because if not, then you'll have to build up a lot of fill material to get up and over your pipe. So it's important to look at the size of the watershed over which you're crossing whenever putting in a culvert pipe. Uh, you need to make sure that your culvert pipe is sized appropriately in order to handle the flow of the water going through it. There are different ways of sizing culvert pipes, um, and there are differences in sizes uh, for a permanent and a temporary crossing. Culvert pipes are generally much cheaper than bridges. Uh, as you can see, there's really only one part that needs to be purchased, which is the pipe itself. Um, in addition, you'll spend a little bit of time on the dozer, uh, installing it, building your approaches, and you may also spend a little bit of money on uh, stabilizing the approaches in, with stone, um, which comes out to be much cheaper than a bridge crossing, typically. Uh, it is a little bit more expensive than a Ford crossing. Uh, the advantage of a culvert crossing over a Ford is that you still have access during flood events, whereas during a, a, a flood event uh, where you have a Ford crossing, you may not be able to access uh, the other side of that stream. So whenever you're installing a culvert, you want to make sure that Typically, you're crossing the stream at a right angle, a 90 degree angle, and that your culvert pipe fits in the channel well. Don't put your culvert pipe in a curve, a bend in the stream channel. You know, try to find a, a, a place where the channel is going straight through. You also want to make sure that your culvert pipe is sized appropriately, diameter-wise, in order to handle the flow of the water, as well as lengthwise 
uh, in order to provide enough room for the road surface on top of the culvert pipe, as well as a little bit of extra for the, uh, the fill material that's going to slope down from the road surface. Uh, typically we like to see a little bit of the pipe sticking out to the end just to hold some of that back. Your head walls, we like to see those armored or stabilized in some way with either riprap or seed and mulch. This is a uh, crossing that's been here for a while and has stabilized naturally with leaf litter as well as other vegetation. Um, and with regards to the fill material, you want to make sure that you have enough fill material on top of a culvert pipe. This is a plastic culvert pipe. It crushes very, very easily compared to a galvanized metal pipe or a cast pipe. And so any of those can crush with enough weight, uh, but typically you want to have about half the diameter of the pipe and fill material over the pipe. Otherwise you risk crushing that pipe that you paid for and uh, greatly reduces the, uh, the, the ability of the stream to flow through the pipe itself. Um, some other things that we see, uh, approaches or the, the running surface on top needs to be stabilized with either uh, stone or if it's a scooter crossing uh, with brush or slash um, and any outcast should be seeded and mulched uh, their soil within the streamside management zone. So another thing to keep in mind when installing culverts is how the inlet and outlet are positioned in the stream bed. Here what we have is called a perched culvert outlet. Basically, the culvert pipe itself is raised up above the natural bed of the stream, uh, creating a little waterfall. Uh, ultimately, this creates uh, some issues with aquatic uh, creatures in their uh, movement up and down the stream. It also creates what we call a head cut over time. You can see here this kind of bowl forming in the stream bed. Now that's because of the erosive forces of the water coming out and down over time. This is only going to get bigger and bigger over time and could create some issues with our road system here in the future. So here we have a pretty good view of the access road coming into this harvest site. Uh, and you can see that there is a little bit of slope on this road. Uh, one of the most important things to consider when you are uh, installing a road or using an existing road is the slope of that road. Uh, especially if you're going to be installing a new road, uh, it needs to be laid out so that it's an acceptable slope to it. And it will help you as far as implementing BMPs and being able to turn water off of the road as well as the trucks being able to access the road. So what are some acceptable road grades as far as BMPs are concerned uh, for access roads to a harvest site? Andrew? So whenever you're looking at uh, haul roads in and out, keep in mind the type of traffic that it's going to be receiving, which is primarily uh, either tandem axle or tractor trailer traffic. These are machines that are not typically designed to go off-road well. And so you want to have a more solid surface, a more level surface, and a more gentle slopes going up and down hill. Uh, typically, you want to keep your slopes as minimal as possible uh, to avoid having to push truck traffic in and out with other machinery. Um, we like to see things around 10% or 13% or less. We like to see brakes in grade periodically as you're coming down the slope just to help with that uh, getting the water off of the road. Keep in mind that long continuous grades are not ideal. You do want to have turnouts periodically. We'll look at some of those in a minute and talk about uh, their finer points. So. Whenever we have uh, legacy roads or historic roads that we want to use, it's important to keep in mind that just because it was built 40 or 100 years ago, that 
it, it's not going to be well designed or suited for your silvicultural operations and the traffic associated with that. Um, typically we see that these roads have more stream crossings, they're poorly located and uh, you know oftentimes follow along uh, stream bottoms or are really steep in design. Um, some of the things that we can do, if there is no other option, you have to use that, that road. You basically need to bring it up to standard. You need to make sure that the stream crossings are up to standard. Make sure that the pipes are sized appropriately if there are culvert pipes. Make sure that there's stone on the road to make it non-erodible. And make sure that uh, any turnouts are functioning appropriately. Um, you may have to relocate certain sections of the road in order to uh, you know, minimize impacts on water quality as well as improve trafficability. So here we have, we're standing on a rolling dip or a broad base dip in our haul road. This is a drainage structure that is intended to get water off of the haul road, keep it from going just straight down the hill, eroding away the surface of the road. Um, basically how it works, we have a dip here and a very small berm. It's gentle enough that we can get a, uh, a tractor trailer truck over it easily without breaking anything. Um, and we also have this part here, the turnout, or a wing ditch as it sometimes is called, um, directing the water off of the road out into the undisturbed forest floor or the undisturbed harvest or through a sediment trapping structure such as a brush pile or silt fence um, should it be close to a uh, riparian area. Um, this particular turnout, uh, this particular uh, broad base dip is semi-functioning. It could be improved by just doing a little bit of work with, uh, with the dozer in terms of grading this, kind of get the ruts out of it so that water can come down and is channeled off and does not continue to go down the road. Okay, so we are standing in a two or three year old cutover and you can see the SMZ or Streamside Management Zone behind us. Uh, a lot of the BMPs that we focus on uh, relate to reducing sediment or reducing erosion and preventing it from actually entering the stream and becoming sediment. And the SMZ is kind of the last line of defense for protecting that stream and filtering out any any soil before it makes its way to the stream. So you can see there's actually two behind us. And Andrew, tell us a little bit about what you look for, kind of what your guidelines are in Virginia for a streamside management zone. So in Virginia, uh, a healthy streamside management zone, what I look for in order to consider something a streamside management zone is a 50 foot buffer on either side of the stream channel measured from the bank of the stream. Now, if we introduce cold water fisheries, so a, a trout stream, then we, we up that to 75 foot wide. And if it is a municipal water source, we like to see a, a 100 foot buffer or even greater if possible on those, uh, those streams. You can harvest within those stream side management zones. Uh, we, however, if you take more than 50% of the basal area, or the uh, canopy cover out of that, you know, it, it's, it's hard to call it a streamside management zone. Typically, we like to leave at least half of the basal area or canopy cover there. Uh, things to avoid within streamside management zones, avoid putting your decks, haul roads, or skid trails there. Um, minimize the number of crossings you have through streamside management zones. Uh, avoid skitter traffic within those management zones, anything that can really disturb the forest floor, the leaf litter in that area. And lastly, avoid you know partial or patch clear cutting or uh, thinning things down too heavily. Andrew, sometimes it's hard to know exactly when you need an SMZ. You know, if there's no flow in water, sometimes you may actually still need an SMZ. So what are the things you look for on the ground to know whether a particular channel might need an SMZ. So typically we 
don't like to see SMZs on intermittent and perennial streams, it doesn't hurt to leave an SMZ on an ephemeral stream as well. Uh, I don't go by a map. I, you know, that I use that as a tool to help me. But ultimately, I'm looking for three things on the ground. I'm looking for channelization, signs of hydrology, and connectivity to the waters of the U.S. So, uh, you know, I can classify something as a stream that you know may not be a blue line on the map. So now we're standing here on a log deck or a log landing. This is the area in which all of the, uh, the trees or stems are brought to uh, an area to be processed and merchandised and loaded onto trucks to be hauled out of here. Um, typically this is a large area of bare compacted soil. As a result, you want to keep that as far away from a stream as possible. Typically, you know, the Virginia State BMP uh, suggests 50 feet outside of an SMZ, so 100 feet from a stream minimum. Um, during harvest, you want to make sure that you minimize any oil spills that you have here. Um, there's a lot of machinery parked here, a lot of machinery maintenance happens here, so minimize that. It is a BMP to have a spill kit on site. Um, also minimize the amount of trash that is uh, left here, for sure. Just pack up your trash and, and take it home. Um, following the harvest, once all the equipment is removed, you want to do some grading here to just put it back to contour, remove any ruts, um, and uh, also add any water diversion structures that may be necessary. If it is on a little bit of a slope, if it needs water bars in it, um, install those. If it needs sediment trapping structures around it, uh, such as silt fence or a brush dam, uh, do that as well. It's also not a bad idea to seed and mulch it. Uh, establish vegetation on an area such as this uh, whenever you're, you're done. Um, a couple things to keep in mind. Deck location. Make sure that your deck is located far enough outside of a streamside management zone because this is a large area of bare compacted soil at the end of the day. Um, it, it has a tendency to erode, uh, sometimes depending on the soil type, pretty heavily. So make sure it's far enough away from riparian areas. Make sure it's limited in size too. Uh, if you don't have that much machinery, try to keep it as small as you can. Uh, during harvest operations, you want to minimize oil spills. It is a BMP to have uh, an, a spill kit on site, on scene, and uh, you know, avoid that. There's a lot of machine uh, machines parked here, as well as uh, machine operations going on, mechanics, uh, in order to uh, fix things. So make sure that your your spills are limited. Also, pick up trash. Uh, don't leave trash behind on a deck. At the end of the day, just pack it in the in the crew truck and uh, take it off site. Um, whenever the harvest is complete, all the machinery is gone, you want to make sure that this is brought back to grade. Um, some of the Virginia BMPs that we look at are, uh, but as always, you know, be aware of your, where you are and what your state or locality's uh, best management practices are for, for these sorts of things. Um, bring it back to grade with a dozer if it requires um, any, if it's on any sort of slope, put in some sort of water bar or water diversion structure, as well as sediment trapping structures around it if necessary. These are things such as a silt fence or a brush dam. Um, it is also a good idea to establish vegetation on this area once, once you're gone through the use of seed and mulch. Um, you can also leave brush or slash behind as well as a means of stabilizing that bare soil. When it comes to BMP implementation on harvest sites, skid trails are an important feature that, that you need to pay attention to. Uh, our studies have shown that across the southeast on harvest sites, uh, about 2 to 3 percent of the area uh, in the harvest site is occupied by skid trails. 
Uh, in, in some cases, depending on the site, that can go up to as high as 7 or 8%. Uh, so it's a considerable amount of exposed soil and something that needs to be stabilized to ensure that we minimize the amount of erosion and sedimentation that can occur. Uh, like any other road network, it's important to make sure that the skid trail is installed appropriately to start with so that you can minimize the chance for erosion. Uh, it's important to uh, minimize the grade of skid trails and also allow for water turnouts uh, to make sure that you get the water off the skid trail and into uh, undisturbed harvest area so that you can filter out any erosion and sedimentation that may occur. Uh, in Virginia, the BMP handbook recommends that skid trails should be less than 25%. Uh, obviously, if they're that steep, water control structures are really important to divert water off of the skid trail. Once the harvest is complete, it's important to make sure that the skid trails are stabilized so that there's no long-term erosion occurring on the skid trails. Uh, three main ways of doing that. Uh, at a minimum, they should have water bars installed at the appropriate spacing to make sure that water is turned off of the skid trail. Also, you can use uh, seed and mulch to get vegetation established on the skid trail to minimize the amount of erosion that would occur. Uh, it sometimes can be a challenge to get vegetation established on skid trails because in many cases the topsoil has been scraped off uh, and you're working with subsoil which is not the greatest for growing grass and in a lot of cases they're compacted as well. So it's important to, uh, to use mulch on those and in some cases they may take uh, some lime or fertilizer to also make sure that you get the vegetation established. The other method is to use slash or logging residues on the skid trail. In some cases, this can be the best method, uh, as as soon as you put the slash down, you've got ground cover, which will protect the bare soil. Uh, and it can also help as far as the operability of the harvest itself. Uh, if you have a wet area, somewhere that's a little bit soft, if you put slash down in that, that area, it can help the equipment operate better and not sink down into the mud. Pre-harvest planning in itself is arguably the most important best management practice. This helps us to avoid problems down the road as well as minimize our costs to harvest uh, you know, this area. So some things to consider whenever pre-harvest planning, you know, not only do we want to look at a, a map of the terrain prior to showing up with equipment, you, know, you also want to walk it to ground truth what's in that map. Um, you want to find ideal locations for logging decks or landings, as well as highway entrances for your haul roads. Um, then connect those two with a road that avoids streams if possible, that stays on relatively gentle grades and does not, you know, uh, get too close to any streams. Uh, if there are stream crossings required to get to a log deck or a harvest area, it's important to note what type of crossing will be used and the specific location at which you will be crossing. Um, it's also important to specify any skid trails that may be necessary. You can uh, distinguish between overland skidding and designated skid trails where you flag out a skid trail um, and any stream crossings that those skid trails may encounter. As always, it's important to mark your sale area, your harvest boundary, to avoid uh, cutting the wrong things. So um, those are some of the, the important things to remember whenever conducting a pre-harvest plan. So we're standing here at the, uh, the Hall Road entrance off of the Blacktop Road. This is going to be one of the things that you take into consideration in your pre-harvest planning, where the entrance is going to be. Whenever planning the location for your entrance, you need to take into account any drainage ditches alongside the road that could be impacted and make sure that you have culvert pipes in place or other appropriate structures. You need to make sure that you have appropriate sight distance in either direction to make sure that no oncoming traffic you know, will come around a blind corner and run into a log truck pulling out. You also want to make sure that this is a non-erodible surface 
right adjacent to the blacktop road to avoid dragging mud out onto the road. And also be aware that you may be responsible for any mud that you drag out onto the road. It's also not a bad idea to uh, limit access. In this instance, uh, behind us over here, we have a, uh, a gate that blocks unwanted traffic, both during and following the harvest. This is uh, important to make sure that equipment doesn't get tampered with, that roads don't get uh, torn up by excessive traffic on the weekends or uh, following the, the completion of the harvest. Right, so on the logging job that we were on today, uh, they have several different products that they are sorting out from this harvest site. Obviously everything is pretty much pine, but they have two different sorts of pine logs uh, going to two different mills. One, the shorter logs is going to a mill where they'll be made into dimensional lumber, two by fours, two by sixes. Uh, and then there is a specialty sort where he's taking longer logs, which is actually going to a, a different Amish sawmill where they're making uh, specialty pallets out of that lumber. The other sort, uh, the pulpwood or pulpwood size material is actually going to an OSB mill where it'll be make, made into OSB boards. And then everything else is being chipped and those chips are going to a power plant to be burned for electricity. One of the questions we get a lot when it comes to biomass harvest is what do the sites look like when they're done harvesting? Uh, one of the advantages actually of a biomass harvest where they're able to chip and utilize the logging residues is that it can leave a cleaner site. Uh, it can make it easier to replant. Uh, generally there's not any site prep required when it comes to reforestation. Uh, and then we also get a lot of questions on, you know, is it taking too much material off the site? So you can see behind me, this is what the site looks like when they are done. So they are finished with this part of the harvest. And you can see that there is still some residue left out here. It's not a complete, uh, you know, bare soil by any means. Uh, there's still limbs, there's still, still some tops that are left on site. And of course the leaf litter layer is there as well. So any of this material like this dead tree right here that you saw that broke off, there's smaller tops. Uh, any of that could be used for chips. You know, if it was up at the landing and they were able to put it through that chipper, then that's something that could be sold and used for electricity. Uh, but from an operational point of view, it's just not feasible to actually use all that. So any of this dead material, you know, if they tried to pick it up, chances are it would break off. And that's probably why this dead pine tree is here. It probably broke off when it hit the ground. Uh, any of the tops, any of the branches, any of the dead wood. You can see some chunks of dead wood behind me. You can see some green tops out of pine trees. Uh, when they break off and hit the ground, that's more than likely where they're going to stay. Just because it's not cost effective for a skidder to go back out and try to pick up that material and take it back to the landing. Uh, so again, like I said, even though it is feasible, I mean, it's, it's possible to chip that and you know it, it could potentially be sold as a different product uh, in general fuel chips are of such low value that it's just not uh, cost effective for the logger to go back out and try to pick up these smaller pieces uh, of material and of course you still have the litter layer the leaves and everything is still intact just as it would be with a conventional harvest uh, so one of the concerns there is that you are removing extra nutrients from the site when you do that uh, and that is true uh, everything is chipped and taken off if it would have been left on the site then those nutrients would stay on the site um, although they may not always be well distributed across the site you know sometimes uh, with a conventional operation uh, those materials might be left in a pile at the landing or they'd be dropped in piles throughout the site not necessarily scattered across uh, the harvest area like you would hope for. So some additional nutrients are removed from the site with a biomass harvest as compa compared to a conventional harvest. Uh, there's been a number of studies looking at this over the years. Uh, and in general, as long as you are not removing the litter layer uh, and you're only doing these harvests, 
you know, at, you know, typical rotation age for conventional products, then for most sites it's not a problem. Uh, but we do recommend that if the logger needs to utilize uh, those residues for BMP implementation, we do recommend they use uh, the residues wherever they need to for implementing BMPs and make sure they take that into account and they don't end up chipping all the residues and then later on realize that they needed them for uh, closing out a skid trail or stream crossing or something like that and and perhaps that would have been a better use of those uh, logging residues rather than chipping them.